Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel, I'm Rob and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Today we continue with the compilation videos which are aimed at people who are working or people who are driving or people who just have a heck of a lot of time and want something on in the background. Please check out the KCC Discord linked in the description down below. There you can talk to me and a whole bunch of KCC fans who hang out there on a regular basis. I look forward to seeing you there. Today we're jumping into some nuclear revenge. Our story today comes to us from also not the mama. <laughs> Dinosaurs reference. Love it. President of HOA wants me to join, ends up wanting to leave the country. Let's jump right in. So this story is about a property I own but rent out. This may sound strange, but I don't think I could afford to live there these days. It's become somewhat exclusive. I've used dollars here because it's what most people reading this will relate to. This doesn't take place in the US and I've given an approximate dollar value for local currency. This is going to be very long. Background. A million years ago, my property was part of a large farm. I bought it about 30 years ago, long after the farm was broken up, but before there was any development near it. The piece of land I got was near the back entrance that joined into a dirt road that ran past. The more expensive plots were near the tarred road in the front. I originally bought a large chunk of the land intending to do some farming, but that never happened. About 20 years ago, some of the owners got organized, we'll call them the organized owners, and had the area designated as a municipal suburb. The municipality agreed to put in tarred roads, water and electricity if a certain percentage of the properties were developed. A construction company linked to the organized owners went around contacting the owners who had land but no buildings, offering to build houses for us at a very, very reasonable price, contingent on them getting a certain minimum amount of people signing up. While this was happening, one of the organized owners approached me and offered to buy half of my property. I agreed, and the money I got for the sale, which was about four times what I paid for the entire chunk of land 10 years prior, combined with a small loan from the bank, gave me what I needed to pay for a house to be built, and it was a fairly large and nice house too. I stayed in the house for a few years, and my mom moved in with me. I had decided to subdivide the property again and build her a house next to mine, but unfortunately, an undiagnosed tumor took her before the house could even be started. Well, it was diagnosed, but too late to do anything. Soon after she died, we moved out of the house and started renting it out. About a few weeks before we moved out, the organized owners I'd sold the land to started talking about starting an HOA. I wasn't interested and left soon after. About two years later, the neighbor organized owner contacted me. There were two roads entering the area these days. The original tarred road that was near where the farmhouse had been and was entered from a fairly busy main road and my dirt back road entrance, which was now a tarred entrance from a wide but not very busy municipal road. The HOA was trying to get the old farm road blocked off to improve security and decrease through traffic, and wanted the road next to my property to be the main and only entrance to the HOA community, and they were pressuring me to join. I said no, and I was adamant, and eventually they accepted that, but told me that they wanted to have a sign near the road welcoming people to the neighborhood, and the only practical place to put it was on the edge of my property. They also wanted to build a little guard hut and have a security guard permanently monitoring who went in and came out, and they wanted to build this shed on my property. We came to an agreement whereby they would mow the lawn and pay the equivalent of about $35 per month in exchange for the land they needed. I was very happy with this arrangement since the property was fairly large and it didn't really cost them anything since they already had a full-time gardening service servicing the HOA. This all happened over a decade ago. They eventually got the other main road blocked off and the HOA is paying for a rent -a cop to be permanently stationed close to my property, as well as mowing my lawn and paying me enough money for takeaways for the family each month. I'm occasionally contacted by members of the HOA to get me to sign up, but I'm really not interested. My property has been rented to the same tenant for all these years and everything there is going well for me. Until about three years ago, when someone scared the crap out of my tenant's young daughter by making strange noises and shooting a pew pew close to her bedroom window three or four times over about a month. This scared my tenant, and I guess it scared the HOA because they and my tenant contacted me with a proposal. I join the HOA, and they give me exclusions from the HOA rules, including exclusions from paying the monthly fees, and in addition, they will build a wall around the entire HOA neighborhood, including electric fencing and security cameras. They told me they had wanted to do this for a while, but were unwilling to build the wall on property that was not in the HOA. 
I couldn't see the downside and so agreed. The Dishonest Dealings It took a little over a year to build the wall and get everything completed, which is quite fast. And then, a month to the day after everything was done, my tenant got an HOA warning about his dogs barking. He told the HOA that while the property was in the HOA, it was exempt from the rules. The HOA told him that they had cancelled the exemptions and that he had 30 days to comply. He contacted me and I opened some mail I'd gotten from the HOA. I'd ignored it since I was supposed to be exempt from the rules and fees. Man did I get a surprise. They had retroactively cancelled the exemptions and were claiming, one, that I pay late fees going back over a year. Two, that the easement agreement had been cancelled and that they were retroactively cancelling it a year back because the HOA contract allowed them to use small unused portions of HOA members' land for the common good for free. Three, that I refund them the money they had paid for the easement over that period. Four, that I owed them money for the garden service mowing the lawn. And five, that I would be fined for each infraction my tenant failed to remedy. This started an expensive process involving lawyers and the court system. That ended with a judge telling me that what the HOA had done was mostly legal. They had the right to revoke the exemptions, but that they had to give me 30 days notice. As I was walking to my car, the neighbor organized owner, the one who had bought half my land so many years ago, told me that I was stupid to have refused to join when the HOA started, as I could have been a founding member, whatever that means and that next time I should be sure to understand the documents I sign before signing them. The malicious compliance. Neighbor organized owner was right. I should have read the contract better. Also, I was interested in what it meant to be a founding member. Spoiler, nothing. And so when I got home, I grabbed the HOA contract I'd signed, as well as all the other documentation they had provided me with, and started reading. I was determined to break every rule I could find a loophole to break. I didn't get past the first page. While the street address of the property is used to identify it for all practical purposes, in the city records, it has a unique property number that has to be used on legal records. When my mom moved in, I'd subdivided the remaining property, but hadn't yet started building on it. And when I gave the HOA the easement all those years ago, it had been on the property I'd sliced off for my mom. And when the HOA set up the contract, they had simply used the property number from the easement. The next afternoon, the neighbor organized owner delivered and had me sign for two documents, one telling me that my exceptions would expire in 30 days and one letting me know that the easement would no longer be required after 30 days. I think he was being a bit malicious here because I lived about an hour away from the property and he drove out himself. The Revenge Exactly 30 days to the hour after the HOA had given me the 30 days notice, I knocked on the neighbor organizing owner's door. Did I mention he was the president of the HOA and had him sign for two documents? The first was that I planned to build a house on my HOA property, which confused him. And the second was notice that they had 30 days to remove from the property, the guard shed, the parts of the electric boom that were on my property, as well as the sign. He tried to engage me, but I ignored him climbed into my car, and drove off. Early the next morning, I got a call from the HOA lawyer, who explained to me that their junk would be staying on my property since it was an unused part of my land. I explained that I was building a house there and that the land would not be unused anymore. I could hear the smirk as he told me that building a second house, to be spiteful, would not be accepted by the courts. I sure hope he could hear the smirk in my voice when I told him that the property in question did not have a house and was, in fact, barely large enough for a house to be built and would not be large enough for any extraneous buildings. I then told him to go look up the property in question and call me back. I had sliced off just enough to be legal, which was just enough to build a small house. It took them just under five days to get back to me. Their lawyer told me that the terms of the easement meant that I could not cancel without their permission. So I emailed him a photo of the document they sent to me cancelling the easement. That afternoon, neighbor organized owner invited me to lunch, his treat, to discuss the problem. I said no thanks. He extended the offer again two days later and again I said no thanks. Others of the original organized owners contacted me to try to talk. Some sounded aggressive, some sounded sympathetic. I said no thanks to each of them. Eventually, the lawyer phoned and asked if we could come to some sort of arrangement. I asked what he had in mind, and he told me that he was prepared to discuss exclusions in exchange for access to my property. So I said, no thanks, and please don't call me again. 
About nine days before their 30 days was up, I got a call from a different lawyer. He said he wanted to negotiate a surrender. His words, not mine. I agreed to meet him at his office the next day. I'd already had documents drawn up, and the meeting was as simple as me giving him the documents and him reading them over. My new easement offer, one, included everything offered by the old easement offer. Two, I changed the line mow the lawn to get the property to HOA standards and keep it there since it was now in the HOA. Three, would cost them about $500 per month instead of 35. This amount would increase with inflation. The previous contract didn't include that bit. Four, when canceled for whatever reason, the HOA would have to pay me a cancellation fee of around $7,500. Five, the contract automatically terminated 30 days after A, any disciplinary action was taken against me, my tenant, or the property. B, any complaints were levied by the HOA against the property. C, any legal action was taken against the property by anyone in the HOA. Six, that lawyer who had offered to negotiate surrender would be allowed to mediate any disputes between us at HOA's expense, and that seven, the HOA would pay all my legal fees if any legal action was taken against me. I deliberately left some insane things in there so that I could appear to concede some points or be negotiated down when the HOA got indignant about the points I actually cared about. The lawyer didn't look happy. He said that my proposal sounded unfair, but that he'd have the HOA president look at them. I reminded him that in eight days, I'd be setting a group of men armed with sledgehammers and anger management issues loose on whatever of theirs was still on my property. That evening, I got an irate call from the HOA president. He told me he was never going to sign the new contract. I said, okay. He then told me I was charging too much per month and that it should be at the same rate as the previous contract. I pointed out that when I signed the previous contract, the area was under development and there was at least one other road leading in and out, but that now there was only mine. And besides, mine was now developed with everything they needed. He told me that I was forcing them to sign a document they didn't want to sign. I told him that he was free not to sign it. He whined about everything he could think of and then eventually told me I'd be hearing from his lawyer. The next morning, surrender lawyer called to ask if I'd be willing to come to their offices to sign the contract. I agreed. When I got there that afternoon, I learned that Surrender Lawyer was not a lawyer but a paralegal. He handed me the contract and asked me to sign it. He laughed when I told him I'd have to read through it first to make sure nothing was changed, and mumbled something that sounded like, I'm sure you would. I read the contract, nothing had been changed, not a single thing, and the HOA president had signed it, with the Surrender Paralegal signing as a witness. I looked at him and said, why did he sign this? It was stupid to sign it. And the paralegal looked at me and said, I started telling him that signing it would be a bad decision, but he told me I wasn't being paid to think or give legal advice and to shut up. So I shut up. I said, do you understand what he signed here? He looks at me and nods. He said, I asked him if I should have one of the lawyers look at it before giving it to you. And he told me that we already billed enough for this and that he'd sign it and sue me after their easement was safe. This happened about a year and a half ago. It took six months for the HOA to find out how screwed they were. They wanted to sue me, but their lawyers explained to them that there was no way to win. Even if the court sided with them, all they would get is the easement contract voided, and they did not think that the court would side with them. The lawyers were adamant about one thing. The HOA could not live with the HOA pays my legal fees if legal action was taken against me since it didn't limit the people taking legal action against me to the HOA. As worded, the HOA would be forced to pay for my legal fees if anyone took legal action against me. They argued that the courts would probably not enforce that, since the context of the agreement was to do with the HOA. And I told them I was prepared to find out, since the HOA would definitely be the ones taking action against me if they challenged it. I eventually signed an addendum to the contract that said that the neighbor originating owner, HOA president, would personally pay all my legal fees unless he held no position at all in the HOA, and that the HOA would pay all legal fees if the HOA took legal action against me. He resigned from the HOA at the end of that meeting. I politely told him in front of everyone that he should not sign documents unless he understands what he's signing. He didn't look pleased. It came out during the mediation. You cannot imagine how happy the lawyers were that their paralegal was mediating. 
that without the ability to control access to the HOA neighborhood through the security boom partially on my property, the HOA had become a gated community a number of years back, the HOA would be in breach of their own articles and would be dissolved. I also learned, should have been obvious to me, that all the security cameras were wired and all terminate in the guardhouse and guard shed. So basically, it was my way or the end of the HOA. That first mediation was really quite funny. My paralegal looked more than a little glum as we assembled and he called everyone to order. I suspected that he had been told to work against me, so I took the initiative. I reminded everyone there that I had agreed to let paralegal mediate, but that I had agreed to no arbitration at all. If I didn't feel like the proceedings were fair, I'd leave, and they could go ahead and sue. Paralegal brightened up and things actually went quite well. I'm writing this after getting home from the latest mediation. I built a paddling pool for the neighborhood dogs, as in I made it myself. I dug a hole, packed it with stone, and added concrete finish. It was my first attempt, and if I say so myself, it looked, well, terrible. The HOA called for a mediation meeting, what they do now instead of taking official action. I've declined their mediation request in the past, in which they told me, as nicely as they could, that the paddling pool was an eyesore right at the entrance of the HOA. I asked them to create a list of what needed to be fixed and how it needed to be fixed to give me at the next meeting. The list was extensive. It basically required the pool to be rebuilt from scratch. I asked them if there was any way to reduce costs on the work they needed to get it up to HOA standards, and they assured me there was not. I thanked them, pulled out a copy of the agreement where they had agreed to get the property to HOA standards, which I'd highlighted, and handed it to them with the list. I told them the HOA usually preferred if these things were dealt with within 30 days. They started arguing until the mediator reminded them that they could not force me to comply without causing the easement to end. I should mention that their lawyers usually no longer attend these things. They said they would get it done. I also learned a lot about Neighbor Organized Owner today. One, I found out that Neighbor Organized Owner sold his property about three months back and is apparently leaving the country for Australia. Two, I found out that the HOA had successfully sued him for a crapload of money they had lost to his mismanagement as part of his vendetta against me. Three, I also learned that he had a vendetta against me. I have no idea what I did to upset him. I'm not sure if I will screw with the HOA anymore. I already think I'm so close to breaking them. The only thing stopping them from canceling the contract is the massive financial loss if they do. I guess a lot depends on how they treat me and my tenants going forward. Also, I do like the monthly payments though, so I'm motivated to play nice. OP added a note at the end. It says, I never intended to go all nuclear revenge. My plan was for a little petty revenge. It's the stupidity and greed and bully mentality of the neighbor organizing owner that turned this into nuclear revenge. I can only take minimal credit, although I did take it and run with it when I got the opportunity, so that's something I guess. Wait a minute, I didn't know we were still sending convicts and shady people to Australia. Didn't that end sometime in the mid-1800s? This is an absolutely brilliant story though, and to think this whole mess they found themselves in was their own fault for trying to F you, and they thought you'd take it laying down, I guess they're the ones who eventually took it laying down. Do me a quick favor and take a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're actually not subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Our next story today comes to us from Craggle Tom. In the 70s, a gang beat up my dad and put him in the hospital, so he got revenge on all of them. Let's jump right in. This isn't my story, but rather my dad's. I know the believability of this might be hard, but I believe this story to be true. My dad was a very nice and hardworking man with some of the greatest patience for BS I've ever seen. But he also had a temper that could make an angry moose turn the other way if he was pushed far enough. Well, when this happened, he was definitely pushed far enough. He told this to me after I told him of all the things I did to prank evil mama bear before moving out of her house. He told me this story once and only once about 10 years ago and never spoke of it again. I wrote it down in a journal from memory back then so I wouldn't forget. So I'll try and retell it as best as I can from what I wrote in the journal a decade ago. And if any of you thought my revenge streak I did on my mother before moving out was too much with the gnomes and laxatives, what my father did was much more brutal and probably explains where I got my conniving side from. 
This story happened in the late 70s. My dad was a young man striking out on his own for the first time. He lived alone in a really crappy part of town while attending college and working at a gas station as a steady job. But the area had a lot of thugs and lots of violence. There was a group of guys he knew from high school that just loved to mess with him. The first thing they did was spray paint graffiti all over his car, a 68 Chevy Nova. Then, they started harassing him every night he was coming home from work or class because they were always hanging around his building. The leader of the gang was a big guy Dad referred to as Ted. Don't know if this was his real name or not. Ted was a relentless bully to several other kids in school. He beat up my dad many times over the years, but in high school in particular, he hated my dad because Ted failed and dropped out during senior year since they wouldn't let him play football with his failing grades anymore. My dad, on the other hand, finished with some pretty decent grades and got a partial scholarship to a local community college. So to say Ted resented my dad was putting it mildly. And one day, when my dad was going into his apartment, Ted and his gang ambushed him and beat him terribly in a back alley. My dad laid bloody and unconscious in that alley all night. He was found in the morning by an old lady walking her dog and she called for help. He was in the hospital for months with several broken bones and head trauma, and this caused him to lose out on a lot of his college classes and he had to retake them. Of course, he told police it was Ted and his cronies that beat him up, but the police weren't very good at their jobs and claimed they had no evidence that Ted did it because he and his friends all supposedly had alibis and there were no other witnesses. Well, that didn't sit well with my dad. He spent some time in physical recovery after getting out of the hospital and then moved to a new apartment with a friend as a roommate. And together, they plotted his revenge on Ted. My dad told me that back then, if police failed you, then you took payback into your own hands. Now, a thing of note is that my grandfather on my dad's side worked at the city dump, and he was always bringing things home to collect, donate, fix, resell, etc. My dad helped him with this a lot, so he learned a lot about fixing and making things, and while with his father at work, he found ways of sneaking into the dump at night. And as a teenager, he would sneak in there at night with friends to find stuff they used to build a hidden fort in the woods nearby. My dad said the fort was so well made that it even had a makeshift wood stove that they made out of recycled bricks and a metal barrel to use in winter to keep the fort warm. This is important later. So over a few nights, my dad and his friends snuck into the dump just like they used to in order to look around for things they could use. Bit by bit, they found some old stinky clothes, shoes, and some old wooden baseball bats, and a few other useful things for the revenge. The dump also had an assortment of used tools the employees found in the trash and set aside to be used on site, but also regularly borrowed. So no one really kept track of them. My dad and his friend kept all of the stuff they were going to use hidden at the fort they made as teenagers near the dump. So they had a perfect place to build the tools of their revenge. Next, they made sure they had as solid of an alibi as they could make. My dad and his friend were living on the top floor in an old three-story apartment building and were already well-liked in the building for being handy and fixing things for his neighbors. The walls between apartments were kind of thin, so neighbors often heard the comings and goings of people on the same floor. They'd come out and greet my dad and his friend when they came home in the evening, and apparently, the building had no fire escape so the doors were typically the only way in or out, and the main door of the building was generally locked at night with a clerk sitting watching the entire time. They came home, checked in with the clerk, said their good evenings to several neighbors, and then locked themselves in their apartment. They waited till midnight and then used a knotted rope found at the dump to climb down three stories from their apartment window, which coincidentally was right above the dumpsters in the side alley. They hid part of the hanging rope behind a gutter pipe and then hoofed it a few miles to the old fort where they'd hidden what dad referred to as revenge cycles. He told me they were bicycles that they'd pieced together from junk parts found in the dump that were built and modified using the borrowed tools to have mounts for carrying the baseball bats and a few other things they couldn't fit in backpacks that they needed at the ready without making much noise or bogging them down. They rode the revenge cycles to the bungalow in an old neighborhood where Ted was living with his friends, though squatting may be a better word. Dad said it was a drug house where dealing was regularly done, which was good in a way because that meant they wouldn't call the police unless they wanted to risk exposing their operation. They scouted the area for a few nights to plan their attack, then waited for the perfect opportunity. 
first, my dad and his friend put on Halloween masks to cover their faces and took a tire iron that they'd brought and quietly removed the lug nuts from two of the wheels that were on Ted's crappy van. Then, they spray painted an insignia that was used by another gang from the area on the side of the van to make it look like this was a rival gang dispute. My dad and his friend then spied on Ted and his gang for hours from the windows, using homemade periscopes that were painted dull black so they wouldn't be seen. Ted and his cronies spent some time getting drunk and high until Ted got so wasted he went to bed. My dad and his friend waited patiently for Ted to start snoring and quietly snuck into the house through the window of the room he was sleeping in, locked the door from the inside and bolstered it with a chair. Then, in unison, bashed both of Ted's legs multiple times right on the kneecaps with the baseball bats. And when Ted tried to cover himself, they bashed his arms too. Then they held him down and emptied a plastic bag of fresh warm crap they'd both contributed to making all over his face before getting the heck out of there fast because he was screaming. Ted's cronies couldn't get into the room before my dad and his friend were out of there. They ducked into another yard and rode off on the revenge cycles from a different street before anyone saw them. But they heard from other people in the area that Ted's cronies tried to load him into his van to take him to the hospital. But as they got going, the wheels on one side of the van came off and they had to call an ambulance. Both of Ted's kneecaps were so badly broken that doctors said he'd never fully recover and would have to walk with a cane for years. As for Ted's cronies, a few of them got arrested. Police came to the hospital to take a statement from Ted and noticed a couple of them didn't look so good. They asked them a few questions, then searched them. They ended up in the slammer for drug possession, which prompted police to search the bungalow they were living in, but some of the other guys were smart enough to move all the drugs to another location when they thought a rival gang was after them. So the cops didn't find much. Ted's remaining cronies later got cornered by my dad and his friend the next night when they followed them in their disguises on the revenge cycles to a back alley where they'd been known to regularly hang out and sell drugs. And this time they brought a pew pew to hold them hostage with. My dad's friend held the pew pew while my dad disarmed them all of some knives they were carrying and then beat them up with a bat. After the beatings were over, my dad and his friend claimed to be with a rival gang and told Ted's cronies that if they didn't leave town, they'd get something a lot worse than a simple beating. And for some added incentive, they sprayed one of their feet with lighter fluid and dropped a lit match onto them, causing the guy to freak out and kick his flaming shoes off. This seemed to work as all of them were gone from the city not long after that. My dad and his friend hid the revenge cycles and dropped the knotted rope from the window into the dumpster below, where they later retrieved it in the morning while taking the trash out and disposed of it. Police, of course, did eventually come to talk to my dad and his roommate, but they claimed no involvement in what happened to Ted, and neighbors and apartment clerk all told them that they never left the building after getting home on those days. My dad and his roommate then let the police come into their apartment to search the place, but they didn't find anything that could be considered evidence, as they had already disposed of the stuff they used by taking apart the revenge cycles and at night burned the baseball bats, masks, the shoes, and the clothes they wore, and the knotted rope in the fort's barrel stove, till there was nothing left but ash. As for the pew-pew, well, my dad said it was never real, but was instead a very realistic metal toy pew-pew that looked real enough in the dark to hold up someone, and they got rid of it by tossing it into the dump. The cops were satisfied in the belief my dad had nothing to do with the incident and just bid them a good day. Dad never told anyone else but me and his younger brother that he and his friends did all that. As for Ted, Dad said he never really bothered anyone again, and he ended up eventually leaving town years later because he was convinced another gang was still out to get him. What happened to him after that, Dad didn't know. I could tell he felt some measure of guilt for what he did back then, but also seemed to feel fairly justified in it as well, since Ted had badly hurt many people around town, just like what he'd done to my dad. So I suppose it was well-deserved on some level, but my dad adamantly told me to never try anything like what he did, and I can't say I blame him. All aboard the Karma Bus, and Ted, we saved you a seat right up front. You know those easy access ones that you're going to be using for the rest of your life? Yeah, there. Honestly, I keep on going back and forth between holy crap, this was an amazing story, and holy crap, they went way too far. One thing's for certain though, this would make a pretty awesome movie. Now, in the comment section down below, who do you think the main actor should be?
Our next story today comes to us from, yeah, not trusting you, mess with my father's girlfriend, your house and your world will crumble. Let's jump right in. This is a throwaway account. My father has passed and the troglodyte he got revenge on might have not been literate, but who needs drama? My father was old school, as in he barely went to it, as in he grew up in the poor side of Brooklyn, mainly Coney Island in the 50s. The poor side of Coney Island was literally the beach. His father owned a beach boat he converted into a house. He was basically one of the kids who ripped off tourists and got regularly beaten up by the cops, just to send a message to any of the other young thugs who plagued the neighborhood. The cops took his brother into the back room and beat on him so long that they got tired. My uncle cursed him, his family, and threatened his kids' gonads if the cop dared untie him. So another cop got involved and got tired. So they bought the family dinner instead of arresting him? Yeah, the whole family was like that. After joining the Navy and straightening up his life, he worked in the worst parts of New York City. First as an armed security guard, he had a story when he was conscripted into a pew-pew fight with gangsters by the NYPD. They wanted more projectiles in the air, and the cops pointed their pew-pews at my dad and his partner, telling them to pitch in. My dad said he looked the cop in his eye and emptied the pew-pew into the ceiling and said, all out of projectiles, bye. He then had a few other words about the NYPD and finally opened his own alarm company. This was in the days when an alarm system was a battery, a long copper wire, and a bell. Then they got a little more complicated. Manhattan and New York City in the 70s was a bit like the Wild West. There were areas that the cops wouldn't go into at night. There were areas that white people were not allowed to walk. My dad had to pretend to be Yiddish to get to work. It was a rough, mean city, and if you didn't lie, cheat, and steal, you went broke. My father learned to participate in the games they played and beat them at it. Them cheating him was not personal, it was how they expected everyone to do business. So he cheated them back before and after. The ones who paid their bills got good service. The ones who tried to steal got it back in spades. Cheat him once and he would simply smile, shake their hand, and ready the dagger. He went to Manhattan on a minor service call one Saturday and forgot his wallet. The parking lots were mob controlled and charged outrageously. They'd keep your car if you couldn't pay, and overnight, it could wind up costing you over $100. Again, the 70s. So, my dad went over to one of the electronic stores and said he was there for an inspection, and proceeded to tell the butthole manager, who had previously cheated him, the alarm bell had burned out. Pulls bell off wall, walks uptown eight city blocks to the second electronic store in the family, butthole's brother, also a lying cheat, Hey, just here for an inspection. Oh, your alarm bell is not working. Runs around the corner and picks up first bell stashed by a trash can. Okay, all fixed. $250. What? You won't pay? Come on. My kid's birthday's coming up. Aw, damn it. Okay, okay. You are a good customer. Pay me what the new bell costs. Uh, $75. And I won't charge for my labor. Oh, you still don't want to pay? Okay, you win. I'll just take the bell and you won't have an alarm tonight. 1974 Manhattan, and a store without an alarm was just begging to be emptied by morning. He paid fast. Then he did the same thing to the first crook, paid his $40 parking bill, and had filet mignon for lunch. That was not the revenge. That was information on how my dad got to be someone you simply did not mess with. He learned the hard way that punching someone in the face was a short-term reply. He could do it, but it simply wasn't as satisfying or safe as being cautious patient, and an outright bastard. My father worked his security business into a moderate success. He had a whole crew of installers, salesmen, and a diversified offering. He worked so hard that it cost him his marriage. After a few years of living alone, he started dating again. Let's call his girlfriend Georgia. I hated Georgia. She was a nut job, but my dad liked her and he wasn't lonely anymore. The thing was, Georgia, being nuts, had to move apartments a lot. If someone or something bothered her, she would wail at the top of her lungs. She would not let up, even if her target apologized to her. She'd tick off the landlord or the neighbor and out she went. I helped her move twice. My dad, seeing a pattern, helped her get a lease, more rights than just renting, and we'd have 10 to 11 months of peace before they could kick her out. The landlord gave over a pretty thick rental agreement, and Georgia handed it straight to my dad, utterly lost. My dad quickly sussed out most of the provisions weren't legal, but if you sign, you suffer and have to pay a lawyer just to start to fight it. 
So my dad had his lawyer rewrite the text, erase the nonsense, and throw in some BS to piss the landlord off when he read it. It cost him a favor and 50 bucks for the special blue paper the agreements were written on. He didn't expect it to be signed, but making the guy know he was aware of the abusive parts of the contract was more important than the money. He was looking at other apartments with Georgia when his lawyer beeped him. Yeah, late 80s, early 90s, beepers were still around. The idiot signed the lease. The lawyer knew no one had read it. Georgia moved into a one-room attic apartment with a lease for six months and an option to renew. Three months in, Georgia has a meltdown. Her fault completely. Landlord calls the cops, says she agreed to leave the residence in one day if the tenant was ever convicted of assault. She actually hadn't. The old lease didn't say that, and he was just high on making it worse for her, trying to get a new apartment. Georgia called my dad. He showed the cops the actual lease. The landlord got more and more concerned with the way the cops were reading the pages and going, holy crap, and you agreed to this? One of the parts was that the lease automatically renewed if the landlord called the cops on her. The cops laughed in his face, dropped the lease at his feet, and left. The landlord immediately ripped up the lease and threw it in my dad's face. My dad told him that if he tried that again, he'd make him eat the pieces. The landlord was a 30-ish wannabe gangster, very, very Italian. A lot of shouting happened, shoving happened. The cops showed back up. My father then informed the cops that the landlord had destroyed his property. A legal document, therefore a misdemeanor. It wasn't, total bluff, and shoved him. He was pressing charges. Turns out the landlord had a few friends and he got away with the altercation. The connections got him into court surprisingly quick. A month later, they are before a judge. I think it took at least four back then. The judge took one look at the lease and shrugged. The landlord's lawyer found out about the doctored lease at the trial death stares at his dumb butt client, and argued that the lease was illegitimate. The judge stopped him cold. You signed it, suffer. The judge said some of the articles contained within might, <clears throat> no friggin' way, <clears throat> not survive challenge, but it had to go through due process to begin. They were here specifically for eviction purposes, and as it was right now, they could not proceed. To make it even more juicy, one of the articles was that he now had to bring over candy every time he inspected, picked up rent, or even visited the house. My father's lawyer brought that up in court just to needle the defense attorney. The landlord still hadn't fully read the lease and blew his lid. Now the judge knew people who knew the landlord, but screaming in his court? Not a smart idea. Gavel comes down, son, if I hear of you being around this lady without a darn mint in your hand, you will hear from me. Do you hear me? I sadly only heard of this epicness as I was working at the time of the trial. My dad was already looking for a new place for his nutjob girlfriend, but he would always show up, throw the mint at the wall, curse, and leave. I picked one up at one point, and I was so thankful she stopped me. Oh, no, that awful man rubs those on his crotch before coming in here. Yikes. She kept all the butt candies in a dish by the front door. Things started escalating when the guy announced he was selling the building. My dad was ready for this. I didn't find out for a few years what had happened, but it did not go well for him. The landlord and his mother started harassing Georgia day and night to get her to move out. They'd show up midday or at lunchtime with people looking at the house, and since they hadn't given her notice, no. Cops again and again. They stopped coming for a while or showed up the next day. The mother and idiot boy would stand outside and just scream obscenities for hours on end. I kind of enjoyed hearing that little turnabout there. They'd bang pots together when she was sleeping, the works, but my dad prepared to get her out of there. The gruesome twosome made them move out as hard as they could, so my dad and Georgia had to do bits and pieces at night. After a week or two, all of her belongings were gone. What I did not know was that there were other things going on as well. Being an attic apartment, there were places that were just null space or parts of the attic unconverted. My father systematically removed all of the plasterboard. He then replaced all of the nails with unfinished copper ones that he had left in a cup of coke for a week. They would quickly disintegrate, and the white paint he used to cover up his handiwork was water-based. It would bleed red and green in about a month. He left a present nailed to the roof under the insulation. A large fish, I think it was a carp, full head and all. This was also behind the plasterboard. The heating was an old steam radiator with the old-style brass pipes. 
My dad drilled holes in the pipe and put steel uncoated screws in the holes. Steel and copper are dissimilar metals and wear each other down. So not only was the area unusually high in static electricity, the radiator now leaked at irregular intervals all over the place. I only helped a little with the move, unaware of the reasons for it at the time, but I was constantly getting zapped. The last bit was something he was inordinately proud of. Being in the security industry, he had access to some serious hardware as far as sirens go. The one he found was a discontinued model that just might have been an air raid siren. He put wood around it, tapped into the electrical circuit, and put a garage door controller onto a relay circuit. Whenever he hit the button, all hell would break loose. He'd be parked around the corner, people would come in, wah, and people would flee. They couldn't sell the property with the random smells, the bleeding walls, the strange dampness in the carpets, so they sold the house they lived in and moved into the two-story. My dad would let months go by and just drive by at two in the morning and wah, letting it run until the two bastards were spitting mad on the lawn before deactivating the siren. He had friends stop by the odd open house and they were almost giving the property away and could not sell it. They thought Georgia was a witch. Well, she was, and had cursed the property. The thing was, they always used the same newspaper to advertise the open houses, so my dad knew when to drive by or give the remote to a friend. The mother and son sold the house a few years later for a heavy loss, and the new owners had to gut the place, out by the piles of trash, painted and repainted plasterboard, still showing green and rust, sticking out of a garbage can was the butt candies. Well, I don't know about you guys, but from the beginning of this story, I was thinking it was going to be some kind of brutal mobster revenge with violence and gore and people getting hurt, but apparently not. This was a landlord story. Not only that, but a landlord story that uses the word butt candies twice. Our next story today comes to us from throwaway2344636. Tit for tat, ruin a career and get yours ruined and your marriage too. Let's jump right in. I used to work at a plastic company, let's say. It was a quickly growing company. I worked in logistics. I'm also gay. At first, everything was good. I was in charge of scheduling and coordinating trucks to pick items up from warehouses, then deliver them to businesses. Across North America, over 40 loading docks, 400 plus clients, seven warehouses, etc. Not a small operation. The total work for scheduling was split between me and another guy. Then, the manager would handle the problems. We used a Google account that was shared between 20 to 30 people. Calendars with docs and times, customs paperwork, BOL, packing slips, everything that our department did was on this one account, and it had an awful password. Basically, it was Plastic Company 1. I mentioned a couple of times that we should change it, but got shot down. Keep in mind, there was no backup. Why bother? It's Google. They won't mess it up. About a year in, and I started to get to know a coworker. let's call him Dave. Dave and I were talking at one point, and we got into men's issues. Suicide rates, injuries on the job, etc. I had never heard this stuff before and was intrigued. I had always bought the narratives. Anyway, manager overheard us at one point. Little did I know, she was a pretty staunch feminist. All men bad kind of feminist. She was also married with one kid. This will come later. I didn't think anything of it. A bit later, manager starts giving me tasks and talk to me about possible promotions. If you do X and Y for me, I'll consider you to regional manager when we expand. I did these tasks over and over. She kept giving me more and more work. At one point, I walked to her desk to see her scrolling up and down through an empty spreadsheet. She turned around and handed me a pile of papers. I need you to transcribe this into Excel by tomorrow. Hmm... Fast forward a year and the company is still growing. We've got more work than ever, me especially, since the manager had realized I would just do a lot of her work for her. It got to the point where I was working late into the night off the clock. We started an on-call system that wound up with me always being on call. Things were getting bad. Then I slipped. I mentioned my boyfriend in passing to a coworker. He gave me a look, then left to talk to a manager. Things got hellish after that. Managers started to write me up on job performance over and over. She would pull me into a room, tell me I was doing great, then have me sign a paper. Little did I know, she was preparing to fire me. 
At this point, I'm starting to fall apart. The long hours without pay, the massive workload, a lot of personal things were all taking a toll. The talks with the manager got weird. She would compare me to her husband or son, then get emotional, acting as if I was them in the room with her. She would try to argue feminist talking points with me, like I was some sort of MRA straw man punching bag, hmm, since she had overheard me and Dave. My coworkers were told not to interact with me, effectively isolating me. It was obvious manager had a chip on her shoulder. One day, I told manager that I wanted to record the talk because I was concerned about the nature of the discussions. That was her last straw. She rushed out of the room, came back, and said I had threatened her and needed to leave immediately. I was shocked. I gathered my things and went home. Later, one from HR contacted me and absolutely refused to discuss anything on the record. They did all the crappy things you can imagine. We promise if you say you'll quit, we'll make sure you get unemployment. I need to talk to you on the phone without recording. I won't do this over email. If you sign this, don't need to read it. We'll make sure that you get your unclaimed PTO. Shocker, all of it was a lie. I didn't give them anything and they refused to discuss further. When I was supposed to get my last check the same day, it got reversed. Fun fact, an employer can just take your checks back out of your account and it's up to you to fight it. They didn't stop there though. They drained my accounts, leaving me with like $50 to live on. Over $3,000 they took. A normal check was a little over $1,000 and I just let it all happen. I didn't fight too much over it. I was in a bad spot in my own life. I had barely lost a dog, had to move under extreme duress into a rush situation, and was barely getting any sleep. I was eventually given notice of official termination, little changes of unemployment since manager had documented our performance reviews so many times. FML. I got cleaned up, found a different job, I was bitter for a long time about it. One day I thought, hmm, wonder if they ever changed that account password. Nope, nobody ever had. The entire department was all in this one account, and I had the password, which meant I could control it. So I signed up for a VPN. I started by connecting to the account from Europe, then changed the recovery details, phone number, address, security questions, etc. Then I waited a couple of weeks. Nothing changed. It seemed like nobody noticed. Next, I went to a public area and got connected using a laptop with a clean Linux install. VPN connected, then connected through Tor. Then I logged into the account from China. I deleted everything, and I mean everything. All the calendars, all the documents, 40 plus gigs of data, gone forever. I left several notes, appearing to be from manager's husband demanding a divorce. I left notes from manager's son, telling her he hated her guts and always had. The next week, I went back and deleted the account. It was unrecoverable for them. The entire operation screeched to a halt and the executives had only one person to look at, logistics manager with severe family problems. Two months later, I checked in on manager through Google Foo. She moved from the city where she lived for 15 plus years with her family to some apartment over an hour away and had gotten a lower paying job at a much smaller company. She wasn't listing her marriage on Facebook anymore her family didn't even appear on the friends list. She wasn't smiling in her pictures anymore either. Okay, regardless of what's going on in your life, who doesn't do something about $3,000 going missing from their bank account? That's a lot of money. I would be all over that. As far as the Google account goes though, I think it's the company's own fault that they don't change the passwords on it, especially when they let somebody go who had full access to that account. That is completely on them. Our next story today comes to us from Just Some Arsehole. <laughs> a homophobe insulted my daughter. I may have ended his marriage. Let's jump right in. So my daughter, 15, has been friends with a girl who lives opposite for years now. And in the past, there have been sleepovers at both of our houses. Adults always stopped and chatted when we saw each other, etc. Last year, my daughter came out as lesbian and a short while later, we noticed that our friends across the road never seemed to want to chat anymore. Recently, my daughter told me her friend had messaged her to say that she wasn't allowed around our house anymore. Yesterday, I saw them on the road and I decided I was going to have a friendly chat and see if I could resolve the issue. It didn't stay friendly very long. 
Dickhead Dad was acting oddly agitated when I brought it up and ended up saying, I'm not letting your effing queer daughter try and do stuff to my daughter. Just because you raised a freak doesn't mean we all have to like it. Side note for anyone who doesn't know, although the term queer has been somewhat reclaimed by the LGBTQ plus community in recent years, it has a long history of being used as a homophobic slur, and Dickhead Dad definitely wasn't using it as an ally. Now, for the next part, it's important to know four things. One, Dickhead Dad has been working from home since the pandemic started. Two, his wife hasn't and works each day. Three, I have been working at home due to injury for a few weeks now. Four, I've seen the woman who visits for a few hours a couple of times a week, and I've seen him smack her ass as she leaves. I stay nice and calm, I take a breath, and then I press the button. I calmly explain to Dickhead Dad that just because my daughter is gay doesn't mean that she would be trying to make a move on a friend. After all, I say, men and women can be friends without it being sexual, just like you and the blonde girl who keeps coming round. He got pretty mad and called me some amazing names as his wife stomped back to their house. I'm guessing things got pretty bad as he left the house less than an hour later with a suitcase and a big gym bag and drove off, tires screeching. I do feel sorry for the daughter if I'm honest, and if only for her, I did wish afterwards I'd kept my mouth shut. Not sorry for him though. <laughs> Today on How to Destroy a Marriage in One Sentence, I love the fact that most of the nuclear revenge stories that we read here have so much buildup and so much planning going into the revenge, but this one was just an off-the-cuff single sentence that destroyed the family across the street. Wow. Our next story today comes to us from Throw It Away One. Try to assault me over petty crap? Enjoy prison and losing your family. Now before we jump into this one, I want to address something that I see down in the comments on KCC all the time, and that's my use of pew pew instead of another word. Well, I use pew pew because if I use that other word, there's a really good chance that my video will get age restricted by YouTube and then it won't be sent out to as many people as it normally is. So a warning for the story coming up, there's a lot of pew pews in it and I'm just gonna keep on saying pew pew. If you don't like it, now is when you need to go to a new video. Let's jump right in. Some backstory, this began before COVID kicked off and has only recently ended. So my uncle was over at my house for my birthday both of us are pew pew owners. I compete in competitions, and he's just the kind of guy to go to the range once a month. We had gone shooting the previous day and only brought out a few pew pews because we had some technical stuff to work on with a few pew pews, so it wasn't really a trip just to shoot. My uncle surprised me on the trip with some tannerite, which is an explosive you set off by shooting it, so we ended up blowing some crap up while out there, but saving most of it for the next day. The next day, we were packing up to actually go out shooting for real instead of spending the day tinkering, and my uncle asked me to bring one of my pew pews that has very expensive and hard to find ammo for him to shoot a bit. I told him I only had about 20 rounds for it, and I would like to save them for another day since I didn't know if I'd be able to find more. Here's where things start falling apart. My uncle is known to be a bit scummy and a hothead, so he snapped and tried guilting me into bringing the pew pew telling me I owe him for the Tannerite. I told him that I didn't realize I would have to pay him back for a gift, and if that was the case, he could just have the remaining Tannerite, then walk back to my room to start putting away my pew pews, since I could tell this was pretty much going to ruin the day. This made him lose his absolute crap and start yelling and stomping about me being an ungrateful piece of crap, and how he should kick my butt to teach me a lesson. At this point, I tell him to get the F out of my house if he's gonna threaten me, and he charges up the stairs at me. My uncle is a very large and fit man, so I grab the bear spray out of my shooting bag, the shooting range we use is in the middle of nowhere, and pointed it at him. My uncle has been maced before, so he quickly backed down and left, damaging my door on the way out. I just went about my day after this, packing up most of the pew pews, but loading a couple into the car because I plan to still head to the range as not to let him ruin my fun. As I'm packing up the car, a couple of police cars roll up and they start shouting at me to get on the ground and they put me in handcuffs. I pretty quickly found out that they were there because my uncle called and said I pointed a weapon at him and mentioned my pew pews. I ended up having to show the police the footage from my security camera before they let me go. 
After that day, I fully cut ties with my uncle and just moved on with my life. But I came to find out that he was talking crap about me to family members, which is when I started plotting my revenge. I knew my uncle illegally stored his restricted pew pews, and I knew he spent quite a bit of money on them, but I also knew the cops probably wouldn't bother since I had no proof. I found out that my uncle had been shooting all the animals in his yard when he lives in the city from my grandma, who he brags and sends pictures to. One of the animals he shot is an endangered species, and I knew my grandma's phone had the picture on it, so I eventually snuck onto my grandma's phone and sent myself all the incriminating pictures, including ones of illegal pew-pews, and reported it anonymously to the police. Today, my uncle got arrested. Fish and Game seized his cars and his pew-pews. His wife has pretty much left him since the police raid traumatized her and the kids, and all of his pew-pew friends have gone off-grid, so he has no support. Court date and charges unknown, but from my research, he's looking at a really long sentence. I feel absolutely no remorse because I've always said I don't think him having access to firearms was safe since he can be violent and he's overall a crap person. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel by OP reporting this and by getting the uncle put away, he might have actually saved lives in the long term because someone who is that quick to anger that has access to that many pew pews, well, that's just an accident waiting to happen. And if you're one of those people who comments about me saying pew pew all the time and really doesn't like it, pew 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 pew. <laughs> now, this one you definitely want to stick around for. This is one of the best revenge stories I have ever read on the KCC channel. And that says a lot because I've done over 500 of them. So if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button for the KCC channel, the one that curates the best revenge stories. Our next story today comes to us from MNWNM. Hell hath no fury like me scorned. Let's jump right in. This story starts 31 years ago, but the revenge part was pure serendipity that began two years ago. I'm going to shorten some, most parts, because it's a crazy ride, but I'll be happy to answer any questions y'all have. I learned an F-ton on this journey, and part of the reason for this write-up is to share that with others. The beginning. In 1990, when I was just out of middle school and my sister was still in elementary, my dad met his third wife at the only gas station in our town. They soon moved in together and my dad abandoned us in our basement apartment to live on a shanty houseboat that didn't run to live with her. He would show up every other week and give me $40 for groceries. Eventually, someone figured out the situation and called my mom. We went to live with her, which was, believe it or not, worse. My dad and his shanty wife got married in 1991. Not long after, she called me and told me my dad's brain tumor had returned, it hadn't, and that he couldn't handle the stress of being around us, that the only people he could bear to be around was her and her son, Shorty, who was my age. When I called my dad to ask if this was true, he said it wasn't, and he just couldn't believe that she would say that to begin with. That was one of our last conversations, until two years ago. The middle. There's not much in this part. I worked my way through college, living in my car from time to time. My dad and I were no contact, but I heard from family that he'd bought a house and put his son through some vocational classes. When my grandmother died, Shorty and Shanty Wife showed up in a truck and took all the furniture and anything else that wasn't tied down or already gone. Eventually, I went no contact with my dad's side of the family. I struggled for years, decades really, but I made it, and I have a great job and a good family now. The best revenge is living well, right? The pre-end warm-up. Two years ago, October 2019, I got a call from my dad's brother, Alan. He told me my dad was in a nursing home in another state, great, and I needed to go see him because he needed my help, WTF. Shorty had ghosted him. <laughs> the nursing home, coincidentally, was about 20 minutes from my house, and I saw an opportunity and I went. The reunion was underwhelming. I didn't want to make amends, but I did want to hear how he wound up dumped and all alone in another state. And it was a really, really good story. Shanty wife got lung cancer and put my dad in a nursing home before she died in 2017. She suffered, and I was happy to hear it, but sad it wasn't butt cancer. Shorty became his power of attorney when she died, and had been visiting my dad, living in my dad's house with his two children, 
and taking care of my dad's affairs since his mom died. But now, he was MIA, and my dad was worried about him. He asked me to drive the hour and a half to his house to check on everything. That's all he wanted. He never even asked me how I've been. I agreed to go, I think out of morbid curiosity. I'd never even been to my dad's house. I did want to see where he lived with his real family for 30 years. I wanted to see what could have been my life. It was 50 shades of effing awful. The grass hadn't been cut all summer. You couldn't get to the front door for the overgrowth. There were three pickup trucks in the yard. Two were full of trash. Cabs and beds and back seats, just trash. Mail, clothes, paper, shoes, garbage bags. I couldn't understand it. My dad's handicap modified SUV was on four flats and full of garbage too. I didn't have a key, so I just walked around. From what windows I could look through, the inside was in shambles and hoarded to hell. On the front and carport doors were dozens of notices from the city that they were going to condemn the place. The carport was also hoarded. Boxes and boxes stacked on each other, most rotting from the rain. The yard was full of garbage, broken Christmas ornaments, more shoes, rusted tools, old toys. There was a letter in the mailbox notifying him that since the house was abandoned, mail would not be delivered anymore. That night, I googled powers of attorney and how to use them. I went back the next day and showed my bedbound dad the pictures on my phone. He vowed to beat Shorty's butt, then asked me to help more. I told him I would, but he'd have to sign power of attorney over to me. All of it. Durable, financial, and medical. If he didn't, he could figure this crap out by himself. He agreed, so I set about finding a lawyer who would drive to another state and do the paperwork in the nursing home. Bless that lawyer for being so good at his job, because all I did was tell him what I knew, and he put together a beautifully bulletproof POA. It was full of stuff I didn't even know I would need. He also filed the paperwork to revoke Shorty's POA, and now I'm unstoppable. We're from a small, rural town, and it's the kind of creepy, landlocked place that no matter how long you've been gone, or how far away you've been, when you go back, you'll see someone you know. Even if you don't know you know them. It's like playing 7 Degrees of Everybody all the time. It's suffocating, but it can also be helpful. The beginning of the end. I got to work the next morning. I didn't know how scorched the earth would be when I finished, and I didn't want Shorty or anyone from his prolific, inbred family trying to find me, so I made sure nothing I did had my name on it. I opened a Google account for my dad and got a Google number. I opened a P.O. box for him in his own town. I put in a mail forwarding notice. I pulled his credit report. I took the POA to my dad's small town bank, changed the address on his accounts, and got new account numbers. I requested copies of every transaction back to the day Shanty wife had died, about 13 months worth. I had to go to the main branch two hours from my house the next day to pick up the records. I sat in the lobby all afternoon going through the account. I cornered a service rep and got a crash course in his debits and deposits. This is when I figured out the extent of Shorty's staggering stupidity. My dad got about $5,000 a month in disability and social security every month. Twice a week, Shorty was going into a branch and withdrawing cash, all of the cash, for 13 months. And every time he did it, as the POA, he had to sign a form stating that he was acting on behalf of my dad. And that form was notarized by the bank. I went through every withdrawal and got the bank to confirm that every one of them was made by Shorty. Then I went to the house and called a locksmith. I knew it was bad, but I had no idea what was waiting for me there. He got the first door open and the stench rolled out like a fog bank. We both gagged. Two locks later, I was so embarrassed by what he had to see and smell, I gave him a $60 tip. And with shiny new keys in hand, I called the cops. I told them I was POA for my dad, was checking on his house, and there were three vehicles there that didn't belong to him. He asked me if I knew who they belonged to. I said no and I wanted them towed. He told me to call a tow company and he would meet them there. They showed up with two wreckers. The tow truck guy got out and asked me for a signature. I only signed my first name. As I was signing, he asked, Do you know Shorty? Running on pure hatred at this point, I surprised myself. Do you? I asked. He said he did and that he's a butthole. <laughs> I responded, He might be. Hey, can you do me a favor? If you see him, will you tell him OP is coming for him? 
his bravado evaporated. He knows a crazy bee when he sees one. They towed the trucks. When everyone was gone, I opened the door in the carport to peek in. The sun was going down and it was dark in the house. I heard something faint and after some seconds, realized it was the roaches and the rats doing their roach and rat stuff. I could smell it all in my hair. I sat on the carport steps and watched the sun go down. I was mad, just so effing cosmically livid that 72 hours was all it took to dissolve three decades and here I was, stinking and listening to the rats and cleaning everyone else's crap up. Taking time away from my family, and for what? I had a coming to Jesus with myself. I would either bow out now or double down. And the thing is, I'm tenacious, to a darn fault. I had to be to survive, and this was a bone I couldn't put down. The thought of Shorty's life being upended, his only source of income probably disappearing, literally overnight, and my dad having to hear, secondhand from me, that he's broke and alone made me absolutely giddy. I desperately wanted them both to lose what they had left, so I decided I was going to triple dog down. That night, I googled restraining orders, and it was surprisingly easy to get one. I went to the courthouse in my hometown, went to the clerk's office, and told her I needed a restraining order. I filled the form in at a rickety little table while I was there. I wasn't prepared to see a judge that day, but she took the form and said, okay, I'll see if the judge is still here. That kind of scared me. She took me to his chambers, and as I was waiting, I looked around and saw he had certificates of appreciation hanging up from various veterans groups. Then I wiped my palms and thought, fish in a effing barrel. He asked about my dad's stint in the Marines and about the DOD office logo on my sweater. I'm a contractor. He read my form and granted the temporary order. I would have to go back for the permanent one, where Shorty would be able to argue against it. Then I went home and googled biohazard companies and elder abuse statutes in my state. I hired a biohazard company to shovel all crap out of the house for $7,000. I would have paid double. They found my dad's mummified dog under some pizza boxes in the master bedroom. They sent me pictures and salvaged some papers. Shorty was served during this time, and a hearing was set. I got to work collecting and documenting crap. I made pictures and spreadsheets and timelines, with cross-references because F it, now they had my full attention. The paid versions of Truthfinder and Trello seriously got me through all this. In my spare time, I went to the nursing home and gave my dad an 8x10 copy of the pictures of his dead dog from every angle. Before court, I went to the police station nearby and told them I wanted to report an elder abuse crime. A white-collar detective came out and told me it was a domestic matter and that since Shorty had been POA, everything he had done was legal. And this was the day I got to teach a small-town detective about the fiduciary responsibilities of a POA. Thanks, Google. I handed him a copy of the statute with the applicable sections highlighted. Then, I handed him a thick folder with bank statements, pictures of the hoarded house and dead dog, a copy of my dad's credit report that showed he was tens and tens of thousands of dollars in debt, and a spreadsheet listing every cash withdrawal with a running total of the stolen amounts. The grand total was just over $130,000 in cash. That's not including the lost value of the house or the credit cards he opened and used. I told him he could keep that folder since it wasn't the only one I had. Then I told him I would wait for a case number and I sat down. He came back about 30 minutes later and apologized, said I had a case, and gave me a case number. Then I headed over to the courthouse. There were other people there and I had to wait my turn and while I was waiting, that stupid mother effer slept his sloppy butt into the courtroom by himself and obviously, literally, non-metaphorically dirty. His shoes were untied and that turned my giggle box over. Then it was our turn and we stood up. The same judge asked me some questions, asked him some questions, and asked me if I had any proof. I had a very thick folder of it. The judge asked me if I had gone to the police. Well, yes, sir, I have. Do you have a case number? As a matter of fact, the order was granted permanently and for life, but not before the judge halted proceedings and told Shorty he needed a lawyer. Someone told me that the courthouse would have a copy of my dad's DD-214 
discharge papers, so while I was there, I got a copy of those, because why not? I also used my POA to take Shanty Wife off the deed to the house. That way, if my dad died and it went into probate, Shorty had no immediate claim. I also went and got copies of my dad's birth certificate and Shanty Wife's death certificate. Technically, stepchildren can't request that info, but the clerk who waited on me recognized my dad's name and told me she lost her virginity to my Uncle Alan in the 60s and went to my grandparents' funeral, so I got all the forms I wanted. Shanty Wife left my dad $50,000 in life insurance. About $35,000 of that was left since Shorty was spending my dad's money and not his mom's. So I opened an Ally account and transferred every penny over. Then I set up recurring transfers for the monthly deposits. At any given time, there was no more than $100 in his account. I also found a house flipper that paid me enough for the house to pay off his mortgage. That's the thing about probate. There's nothing to fight over if there's nothing there. And I made sure there was effing nothing there. My dad died thinking he still owned a house. Speaking of which, this is about the time I found my dad's life insurance policies. They were up to date and Shanty Wife was the beneficiary. My POA didn't allow me to change beneficiaries, but it allowed me to assign them. And since Shanty Wife was dead, there was technically no beneficiary. This is where the death certificates came in handy. I assigned my sister and me as beneficiaries, irrevocable too, which means that the only way to change that is for my dad and me and my sister to agree to it. I kept my dad in the dark about all this. The only thing he ever really knew about was the restraining order and his dead dog. I found out that he had purchased the gravesite next to Shanty Wife and wanted to be buried next to her. That was just never going to effing happen. I googled national cemeteries and found out he qualified to be in one since he was a disabled Vietnam era veteran. So I arranged for that instead. All the cherries on top. My dad died in June of this year and I was there. He's buried in a national cemetery far away where no one will ever go visit him. The only obituary I ran was on the funeral home's website and that only for insurance purposes. I wrote it as vague as possible. There was no service. His urn is purple, the color he hated most. I got a call in August from the prosecutor's office in my hometown. The lady on the other end is married to my first cousin because of course she is. That's how it effing works there. Shorty was arrested just after midnight on July 1st, was still in jail, and had to be arraigned on felony elder abuse charges. He's facing 10 years in federal pound me in the butt prison. She told me not to expect the trial anytime soon, as it can take up to three years for that to happen. I told her that was awesome, since the uncertainty will hopefully haunt him. And after all that, he's still got prison to look forward to. He lost his kids, he lost his dad, I'm spending his mom's cancer money, he lost his free house and trucks. He has no credit and will never be able to get any sort of decent job and will, hopefully for a long time, not be able to find a decent place to live. And I sleep like an effing baby. Okay, there's a couple of things to go over on this one, but number one that I just can't get out of my head here is that the court clerk got it so good from his Uncle Alan that she broke the law and gave him all the forms he wanted. Wow. Now guys, how many ladies do you know that would do something for you because they got a really good d from your uncle many, many years ago? What? Beyond that, OP, this is one of the most calculated, impressive revenge stories that I have ever read. And we've done probably 500 of them on this channel. I'm glad you were able to secure a bit of a future for you and your sister and get the toxic people completely out of your life. Check out OP linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow. Our next story today comes to us from this guy right here. They kicked my friend's mom out, so we trashed their store and got it shut down. Let's jump right in. Okay, I realize this may sound terrible, but you have to read through the whole story. This happened about 15 years ago when I was living overseas. Now I'm in the US. Let's just say I used to live in a developing country back at the time. Me and my friend, let's call him Han, were driving around the city one night when he got a phone call from his older brother, let's call him Barry. The phone call from what I was able to comprehend was pretty intense. After Han hung up, he was pretty frustrated. He told me to drive over to the supermarket near his parents' house. 
I did. I asked Han what was wrong. He said it looks like Barry has gotten into a fight and that he needs our help. I told them, let's go see what's going on. On our way to that supermarket, Han called a couple of our friends and told them to meet us there for extra support. I know how this may sound. It sounds like we're a bunch of gangbangers looking to go start some crap. So before y'all start jumping into conclusions, let me give you some background. The community I used to live in is heavily tribal. It's not about ganging up, but more like standing up and being there for a friend in need. That's the common mindset and that's their way of life. It's pretty backwards at this day and age, and it's worth pointing out that I'm completely against that mindset now, especially that I'm living in the US. But anyway, we eventually arrived at that supermarket. It was in a very busy and vibrant area with lots of traffic. We parked our cars at the front door and stood out in the street waiting for Barry until he showed up. He was enraged but yet calm and on point. We asked him what was going on, so he went on explaining. Apparently, Barry and Han's mom went into the supermarket to buy some chicken. She did manage to buy some chicken in a sealed container. She needed it to cook for the day, but when she got home and opened the container, the chicken smelled absolutely rotten and disgusting. Understandably, she decided to go back to the store and return that chicken, notify the store management, and get another chicken that isn't salmonella in a box since she shops there quite often. I know my friend's mom, she's not a Karen in any way, and she's this super sweet lady in her 60s who is very friendly with everyone she meets. When she went into the store, found the store manager, told him about the rotten chicken, and asked him, politely, to give her a different one, she was even discreet about it and didn't want other customers to hear. The manager was super rude and refused to acknowledge that there's anything wrong with the chicken outright, refused to exchange the chicken, and wouldn't even smell or look at it. He called her a liar and told her to get the hell out of his store. Han, having learned that his mom was insulted that way, was pretty furious. Barry told us that he was going inside to talk to that manager and give him a piece of his mind and that he wanted us to be there on standby in case things go down. We agreed and waited outside. Barry went in. We were looking at him through the glass door. We saw him speak to that manager with a clear understanding of how heated the conversation was getting. Basically, Barry asked the manager if he's the one who told his mom to get the hell out, and the manager says, yes, and you get the F out too, and shoves him away. Now a little background on Barry. He was feared. He's always been kind of problematic since he was little. He was never a bully, but he just never took crap from anybody ever. Now, while I didn't agree with the way he handled things, I've always respected how he stands up for himself and for the people he cares about. It's worth mentioning that he's a lot more calm now. Within seconds of him going into the store and after hearing how belligerent that manager was, Barry lost control over his rage and we saw him start throwing punches at that manager. Other employees joined in on the fight too, and hell broke loose. Me, Han, and another friend of ours immediately jumped into the store. We started to trade punches with whoever was fighting. It was an utter cluster F. All I remember was that I punched the manager a few times, and then I was on the ground. I didn't get punched or anything, and still have no idea how I ended up on the ground. Luckily, no one got really injured from either side, but we had a clear advantage over them. The aftermath was horrific. Glass was broken, shelves were knocked down, and product stands were destroyed. I still remember M&Ms scattered all over the floor. It was a hot mess. At that time, we knew we were absolutely effed. We pretty much vandalized the whole darn store and physically assaulted its staff. Eventually, we left and stood in front of the store and started cussing them out. They stayed inside the store because they knew that the law would be on their side while they're on their property. So, about the laws in that country. They make absolutely no effing sense whatsoever. A good example of its ridiculous laws is, if you get physically assaulted by someone and you decide you want to press charges and you do just that, you will need to go get a doctor's note stating your injury and then head to a police station and press charges. The person who assaulted you will get a phone call from the police telling them to come to the police station. That person can also press charges the same way even if they're not at all injured. If both parties have pressed charges, both parties will go to jail awaiting trial unless bailed out. 
it's also worth mentioning that obtaining a forged doctor's note in that country is easier than buying a tub of sour cream. Fact. That said, we knew that we'd better hurry up and press charges. We got to the police station before the supermarket staff and filed a complaint against them. They eventually arrived like 15 minutes later to do the same thing. It was the butthole manager and another guy that was in the fight too. At the police station, it was a shock to me how nicely we were being treated by officers and how crappy they treated the supermarket staff. Like, what the F is going on? Shouldn't we be in handcuffs right now? What I didn't know was this. While we were standing out the door cussing those guys out after the fight, Barry disappeared. He did meet us at the police station, but we didn't know what he was doing after the fight was over. Well, it turns out that while Barry was exiting the store after the fight, he started yelling, My name is Barry, last name, and I'm not done effing you up. Apparently, a passing by police patrol heard Barry yell at the top of his lungs and stopped to see what was going on. Out of sheer coincidence, one of the patrolling officers turned out to be a distant cousin of Barry. It's a small country, and he recognized his name while he was shouting it. He took Barry aside for a word and started asking him what was going on. Barry explained the entire story of how they insulted his mom after selling her bad chicken and refused to admit any wrongdoing. The officer also turned out to be an on-duty health and safety inspector. He then took it personal and assured Barry that he'll take care of it. Anyway, back to the police station. Now that both parties have pressed charges, the police were clearly favoring us. They threw the supermarket staff in a cell while we were sitting on the couch sipping coffee. <laughs> Barry was still cussing the manager out. Eventually, we reached an agreement to drop all charges and we all went our way. Now the real revenge. After the store was picked up and everything went back to normal, kinda, Barry's officer cousin went to the supermarket on an inspection the next day. Do you see where this is going? Yep, he found tons and tons of badly stored meat of all kinds that was completely inedible and could potentially be life-threatening. He also found spoiled dairy and a buttload of expired items. Apparently, the owner orders the staff to unplug the fridges and freezers at night to save on electricity. The owner was knowingly selling rotten meat to save a few bucks. The store was immediately shut down pending investigation. The health ministry got involved and fined the supermarket and the fine was just so huge that the store stayed shut down and never opened again because the owners weren't able to financially recover. Gotta be honest on this one, OP, you might have actually saved somebody's life by getting this thing shut down because rancid meat could definitely kill somebody if they ate it. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. Our next story today comes to us from Karasu Tepis 80. Try to strong arm evict me illegally? We'll see about that. Let's jump right in. This happened back in 2010 when I lived in Winter Garden, Florida with my husband and his dying uncle. Background, my husband and I moved in with his sick uncle after losing so much during the 2008 housing market crash in the US, like many of my husband's long maintenance customers. We also moved in with his uncle into a condo because his uncle had stage 4 cirrhosis of the liver and his self-entitled sister and her family refused to help take care of him. My husband, a retired Seminole County Sheriff's Officer, important later, and I got ourselves set in the condo's two bedrooms as his uncle had himself set up in the living room, including his bed. On the first day, we found dangerous black mold caused by a leaky dishwasher. On the second day, we found the master shower had loose tiles and a leaky shower head. On the third day, we found a nest of brown recluse spiders in the living room. We talked with his uncle about these problems and found out that the slumlord, friends with the self-entitled sister and aunt and her family, was refusing to take care of the issues as required by law. We wanted to start legal actions then, but my husband's uncle talked us out of it several times. The slumlord was nice to us so long as my husband's sick uncle was alive. The very next day after my husband's uncle died was a completely different story. Slumlord had turned nasty, aggressive, and began to try and strong arm evict us like we were nothing more than drug addict squatters. Slumlord even bowed up and aggressively tried to fight my husband when we dropped off our next rent check. He kept telling us that we had to move or else, but yet refused to follow actual Florida laws to evict us. Slumlord and his corrupt Winter Garden PD code enforcement officer wife 
even recruited my husband's self-entitled aunt and uncle to start harassing about just moving even if we have to live in a tent. Why don't you and my RSO nephew just move so they can rent the condo to another senior? We don't have anywhere else to go yet and he must go through the eviction laws or get into very serious trouble. You're nothing but trouble, retired SCSD officer nephew. You've been problem since the day you were born. Get out of their condo and stop being a problem for everyone. Who cares if you have to live in a tent? All of this made my retired SCSD officer husband, who specialized in uncovering corrupted law enforcement, very suspicious. We talked and began investigating slumlord and corrupt code enforcement wife. My first order was to place all rent into escrow with evidence of repairs that have been neglected. Second, I sent a notification of cease and desist of harassment to the slumlord and self-entitled aunt. Next, I researched public property tax records. Woohoo! Pay dirt there! Slumlord's condo wasn't registered as a rental property with the state of Florida and was paying far less in property taxes than Slumlord should have been paying. Property tax records also showed that Slumlord did not own the condo. It was still deeded to his mother, which I found out had been living in a retirement home for five years before my husband's uncle moved in. My husband found out that corrupt code enforcement wife had been inspecting and signing off on hers and Slumlord's properties, including the condo, which is against Florida code enforcement conduct laws. I found out from neighbors in the condo that Slumlord had only been renting to seniors with severe health issues. My best discovery though, next to tax evasion, was finding out that the Condo Owners Association had a very strict no renting or leasing policy, meaning you or a family had to live in the condo and couldn't be rented. The Revenge Now that we had all of our evidence, my husband and I began to knock down all of the Slumlord's dominoes. My husband went and filed a complaint with the Winter Garden Police Department about corrupt code enforcement wife and her perjuring inspections on her family properties. My husband has a glowing record in Seminole County and with FDLE for having over 200 clean arrests and taking down nearly 60 corrupt public officials, including Child Protective Services in the early 2000s. This background helped push WGPD to open an investigation into corrupt code enforcement wife. They discovered that not only had she perjured inspections on her family's properties, but also on my husband's self-entitled aunt and uncle's property as well. This got corrupt code enforcement wife fired, stripped of her state enforcement officer's license, and convicted of multiple crimes. I sent all property tax fraud evidence to the Florida's Property Tax Division. That got the state to investigate Slumlord. The state found that not only did he commit property tax fraud on the condo, but also on a property that he was renting to his son and self-entitled aunt's son, along with business tax fraud and income tax fraud. Both Slumlord's son and self-entitled aunt's son were also busted for possession of illegal narcotics with intent to sell when investigators came to the rental house they lived in. I never expected that much fraud to be found from all of this, but I'm glad it happened. The business tax fraud of Slumlord affected self-entitled aunt and self-entitled uncle as well, since they were his business partners. Self-entitled uncle then came under investigation by the USPS board as he was the postmaster of Winter Garden. Self-entitled uncle lost his comfy job and pension after it was discovered how he was assisting Slumlord in the tax fraud scam and for stealing money orders. All four were convicted of multiple white collar crimes, had to sell their properties and most of their stuff serve some form of time, and pay huge amounts of fines and restitution. Slumlord, his wife, hubby's self-entitled aunt, and hubby's self-entitled uncle, along with their sons, all went down for multiple crimes, both felonies and misdemeanors, all because they thought they could strong-arm evict us. Just proves how smart we tenants can really be when pushed. Also proves why everyone should know all rental laws and how to research public records, because it can save you in the end. You see, this is why he only rented to sickly elderly people. They wouldn't be able to fight for their rights like you could. That's probably why they didn't want you there. Because you're younger, you knew how to look things up, and you weren't vulnerable like the older people. If there's two things that you take away from this though, it's that you need to know your rights, and you need to know your rental laws. Our next story today comes to us from user ad 4905 Ex and boyfriend hurt my daughter, 
tarnish my friend's reputation, and I seek revenge. Let's jump right in. To start off, this is a throwaway as I don't want it to tie me back. Also, buckle up, this is going to be a long ride. These events took place over several years. I hope it's worth the read. So I'm going to begin with the main players, me, my ex-wife Pepper, revenge target number one, her boyfriend Steve, revenge target number two, the boyfriend's ex-wife Maria, co-partner in the revenge, my daughter Sarah, and my friend Jason, accomplice in the revenge. With that said, let's get some backstory out of the way. So Pepper and I had a very up and down marriage. It was one of those that I was madly in love with her, but looking back, I think she was in it more for the money and convenience. She had one son we will call Drug, because he was and still is a major drug addict. Before we got married, and I also had one son, name is unimportant, that I had full custody of. While married, we had Sarah. I toughed the marriage out for as long as I could, but eventually, we just couldn't keep it together. We separated, and due to traveling some for work and having custody of my son, I moved back to my hometown a few states away so my parents could help but kept an apartment in the town that Pepper and Sarah lived in, so that I could still spend as much time with my daughter as I could. At this time, I asked my best friend Jason, who is a lawyer and owns his own firm, to do up a child support agreement for us. It is very important to note that we only address child support. It had nothing about custody or visitation or anything else in it. So, for about a year, this was how it would work. I would spend a month with Sarah while my parents watched my other son, then I would spend a month with my son. Almost exactly a year later, I could no longer afford keeping two households, and Pepper was wanting to move back to her hometown, which was in a different state, but closer to where I lived. So I gave up the apartment, and she moved. The new situation continued for a couple more years. Pepper and I remained friendly and even tried to reconcile the relationship a couple of times, but it wouldn't work out. I was still deeply in love with her, but we couldn't come to an agreement on things like where to live and such. I forced myself to try and move on and started dating. She had been dating basically from the day after I moved out. Even though I still loved her, our relationship moved more into good friends than husband and wife. So she finally meets Steve. I never was told much about Steve other than he was a certified ethical hacker and that is what he did for employment, important later. While they were dating, she would send me texts about their date. She even texted me the day they first had sex together. This hurt deeply, and looking back, I think this is what she wanted, but I tried to play the part of a good friend and confidant. Steve and Pepper had been dating for six months, when out of the blue, she tells me they broke up and she realized that she is madly in love with me. Since it's at the beginning of summer, she packs some suitcases and heads to my state. They were going to spend the summer with me and see if they liked it or not. We had an amazing summer. All the kids are getting along, Drug even loved it here, so he makes it official we are back together and they are moving in. We went and registered my daughter for school. We even were able to get her on a peewee cheerleading team for the summer. She made several friends and was loving being here. There was only one problem. Pepper still had an apartment that had all her furniture and stuff in it. I offered to go up with my truck and help load everything, but she insisted that her and Drug can get it done. So off they go to pack up and then head to their new home. As you can guess, things don't go as planned. She was home for about three days when she informs me that under no circumstance will she move and that her and Steve are in love and are moving in with each other. To say I was destroyed was an understatement. I couldn't understand why she had done it. The worst part was she left it to me to tell Sarah the bad news. When I told her, the devastated look on her face started turning my feelings of hurt into feelings of anger. Then, Sarah broke down and started begging to stay with me and started spilling the beans. She told me things about how her mom would leave with Steve for days and leave Drug in charge. She had to learn how to cook for herself at 8 because Drug would spend the money on, well, drugs and spend the whole time high. If Drug wasn't left in charge, Pepper would use her multiple convicted felon niece to watch her. She also told me about the first time that she had met Steve. He came to their house, basically said hello, and him and her mom disappeared into the bedroom and started having loud, uh, adult relations. Sarah was outside the door bawling and they just ignored and continued. This is how my 8-year-old learned of adult relations and she is still in counseling trying to recover 7 years later. At this point, my anger has turned to rage. I immediately notified Pepper that there was no way Sarah was coming back, 
and I would fight her to the death to keep her out of that situation. Pepper responded by getting an emergency hearing in her state to force Sarah back. I had to scramble, but I managed to get a lawyer and easily won the hearing, which Pepper showed up late for and told the judge it was due to a disability. The judge agreed that since there was no custody agreement and with the troubling accusations that I had gathered, it was best for now for Sarah to stay with me. I had won the first battle, but it was short-lived. Within an hour of the hearing, I started getting tons of phishing emails and texts. I was also getting password resets and MFA codes from my bank, Facebook, Reddit, and any other accounts. I knew that Steve was behind it. The very next day, Jason calls. His law firm's website, email, and phone account had been hacked. Because he had to disclose the hack to the court and because he was working on a semi-high-profile case at the time, the FBI got involved. To say I was enraged was an understatement. These two people had destroyed me, harmed my daughter, and tarnished the reputation of my lifelong friend. It was time for them to pay and pay dearly. I was a man on a mission. I spent hours digging up as much dirt as I could on Steven and Pepper. I had a lot of luck with Pepper. I found social media posts of her out late drinking that correlated to tardiness and missed days at school for Sarah. I found tons of pics of her and two strange kids doing fun activities. I found neighbors that were willing to testify that Sarah had come to beg for food because she was left with either drug or the felon. I knew I could bury her. Steve, on the other hand, had all his accounts locked down. I couldn't find any dirt and it was driving me crazy. Then it hit me. Try LinkedIn. It paid off. There wasn't much posted, but through his account, I found Maria, his ex-wife's account. I reached out to her and she happily accepted. Maria and I became best friends. She hated Pepper, for good reason, as they had both abandoned her kids like my daughter and didn't want her around her kids. I learned so much. To keep it short, Maria and Steve had recently divorced. As part of the custody agreement, Steve got the house, car, bank account, savings, and a lower than usual child support. Maria had traded all that money to have control of the kids. She knew he was a scumbag and all she was concerned about was keeping her kids safe. They had a very detailed custody agreement with rules for Steve to follow. As part of that agreement, if Steve broke any rules, then he had to pay and pay dearly. He had to sell the house and give her half of everything. His child support would also double and Steve would be financially ruined. Steve also didn't have her blocked on the social media and would regularly send texts bragging about how great his life was without her. Many of these texts had pictures of Pepper in them. We compared notes, we swapped evidence, we came up with a plan. And now it's time for revenge. First, I got with Jason. He let the FBI investigator know that I had also had some hacking attempts and we believed it was the same person. The investigator called quick. I gave him all the information I had and who I believed was doing it. And he asked a weird question. Do I know where Steve worked? Well, yes, I did, thanks to Maria. So apparently Steve wasn't as good as a hacker as he thought himself to be. They had already traced back the hack on Jason to a business, the very same business Steve worked for. As soon as my conversation with the FBI was done, I called his work to lodge a complaint. I told the manager that someone was trying to hack me and I was sure it was Steve. They, of course, did not take it too seriously because I had no proof. What they didn't know was that they were soon going to be getting a visit from a special agent. The next week was absolute hell for Steve and Pepper. Pepper got served with the divorce papers and her lawyer got served with all the evidence I had gathered. My lawyer said it was the most complete investigation he had ever seen. I had all 40 tardiness and 19 absences tied to nights out drinking with Steve. I had hard proof of them abandoning my daughter for days at a time. Maria even gave me a picture that was taken at 2 a.m. the night before the emergency hearing with Steve and Pepper drinking in a tattoo parlor. The same hearing she was late to and said it was due to a disability. Steve got served that he had violated the entire custody agreement. Maria had pictures from me proving he was with Pepper on nights the kids were with him and they were left alone. She also had proof that there was contact with Pepper that violated the custody agreement. The fallout was awesome to watch. Steve was fired between my complaint, another older complaint of him hacking, and the FBI showing up. They had no choice but to fire him. He did avoid any legal issues as the FBI could never tie it directly to him. 
the word spread of why he was fired, and no one would hire him in an IT job again. He had to sell the house, liquidate all the investments and bank accounts, and give half to Maria. His child support got to stay the same because he no longer had a source of income. Last I heard, he was working at a grocery store. So in total, his income went from 200k plus a year to less than 40k. As for Pepper, the divorce was swift and painful for her. The judge ruled in my favor for all counts. I got sole custody and sole decision making. She was forced to go to counseling and her drug can only visit Sarah with a third party supervisor paid for by Pepper. Sarah is doing much better, she still needs counseling, but she thrives in school and has many friends. She very rarely sees her mom, but she is much better off without her. I don't see this one so much as a revenge story as a father just protecting his kids. OP, just know that your daughter is in the best possible position that they could possibly be in now, and that is thanks to you. Make sure she keeps up on the counseling, because that will only help going forward as well. I thank you for watching, have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.